Hello, this is Samuel Ornelas here from Aguascalientes, Mexico, and you are watching Teacher Learning Cast with Peter Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number eight. Today is April 14th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart from beautiful Aguas Calientes. Good morning, everybody. Piri Herrera, also here from Aguas Calientes, Mexico. In the first day of the Feria de San Marcos, everybody's welcome to join us here in our beautiful city. A very big and important event, a uh, cultural event with a lot of uh, activities to do. And Teacher Learning Cast is on the air Saturday, 8, 15 a.m. Well, today, a little bit <laughs> later for the first time. Sorry about that. But I, I'm, we are glad to have you with us today. If you want to uh, reach out and uh, be a part of the broadcast, feel free to leave comments on our Facebook page. You can uh, find us at Teacher Learning Cast in Facebook. It's a public page where you can join and get information about uh, what we discuss. And uh, if you ever want to also be a part of our live broadcast every Saturday, also feel free to reach out to us. And uh, we're always looking for uh, teachers, educators, learners, uh, anyone really interested in teaching and learning to be part of the conversation. Yes, and you can if meet us. Like yeah, people, people can reach us at, at our different uh, media and, and different means to the, the easiest way to get to us is just Google teacher learning cast with the name Benjamin Stewart or teacher learning cast with the name P.D. Herrera. And you're going to get different pages because you're going to see uh, Ben's, Benjamin's personal website, my personal website. You're going to see the Facebook pages of us. And you're also going to see the, the Facebook page for Teacher Learning Cast. So that's the easiest way to reach us. But you can also get directly to our website, which is um, Benjamin's website is benjaminlstuart.wordpress.com. And my website is PD, uh, uh, Hummers, sorry, is Hummers2000 um, dash, uh, dot weeksite dash PDHA. And also, if you, we have a, uh, a page in YouTube and uh, we're also checking for comments there. So feel free to post qu uh, questions. If you're uh, watching this broadcast live, feel free to leave those. We'll be trying to uh, capture those questions uh, as, as much as possible throughout the broadcast. But today, PD, um, I wanted to talk to you, to everyone uh, about the SIAP model. And uh, today we'd like to talk a little bit about that and in terms of teacher talk time, kind of combine those two topics today. So I'm going to start uh, by sharing my screen here. And I'd like to begin first before I introduce really what the SIAP model is, the Sheltered Instruction Operation Protocol. I would uh, first like to think about really the differences between second language acquisition and foreign language acquisition or foreign language learning and second language learning uh, because I think this is kind of relevant in terms of the SIAP model which really comes from uh, the United States and this whole movement of trying to integrate English language learners into the mainstream uh, classroom and so if we look at the differences between second language learning and foreign language learning basically second language learning is where English language learners are in or within speech communities that are of the target language. So for example, English language learners living in the United States would be living primarily in a language community that, sp that speaks English or the, the target language, where their native language might be a different language. In contrast, a foreign language learning situation would be, for example, here in Mexico, where you have Eng English language learners uh, living in a, uh, an environment or a speech community that is part of their mother tongue, okay, in Spanish in this case, right? So they would have uh, theoretically less opportunities uh, to have exposure to the target language. 
Now, these are theoretical ideas because there are many variations. I, I think we can easily imagine an English language learner living in the United States where if they go home uh, to their families that are speaking in their native uh, language, then, you know, there's a gray area there. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea with the SIAP model, which I'll go into detail here in a few minutes, is really about looking at second language acquisition and trying to find ways to incorporate uh, or help learners through that transition into mainstream classroom. And I want to bring this up because I, I want to try to uh, explain to the relevance to the same model in a foreign language uh, le learning acquisition. And I noticed there's a, looks like there's spelling mistake here. It looks like there's a or cut off there. But anyway, foreign language learning versus second language learning. So the SIAP model was developed, like I mentioned, primarily in the United States. And uh, Pearson has really jumped on board as well to promote this idea of the SIAP model. But essentially, it, set out to, it sets out to help every teacher become a language teacher. So it's really the idea is to reach those teachers and find ways that they can make input more comprehensible. They can make information, the classroom, more accessible to a, a learner that does not speak English as a native language. And so if we look at what the SIAP model is, and I know this print's a little bit small here. Let's see if I can, uh, is, yeah. So can you see that, PD? Is that uh, big enough, the text? Uh, sure. Yeah, I guess, yeah. OK. Uh, basically, the uh, SIAP model consists of eight different components. And those eight components can be divided up into three main categories. The three main categories, the first being preparation or lesson preparation or planning, if you will. Uh, the second is the implementation. And the third category would be assessments. Okay, so if we look at these eight different components, the first component, lesson preparation, primarily deals with uh, lesson planning, uh, primarily. And within this category of planning, you the the main thing that sets the SIAP model apart from, let's say, a general English course, is the idea of trying to integrate both content objectives with language objectives. And I think this is the the point that I want us to really think about. I think for me, and teaching, especially in a foreign language uh, scenario, is how to bring out those two different sets of objectives, content objectives versus language objectives. There are other aspects of the lesson planning process that also deals with uh, coming up with certain materials based on uh, the, the type of students uh, that are uh, involved and trying to find uh, the most appropriate content for the age educational background of, of the learners. Okay, so the, the idea with the lesson planning is trying to figure out how to adapt the content, how to plan for the adaptation of the content for the learners, how to integrate these materials and try to merge both the content language objectives, but all through the planning stages. The rest of these I'll talk very briefly about, but this is more uh, the following components are more adapted or more related to the uh, integration or the instruction or implementation of the class. So building background, uh, we might look at uh, how to scaffold our lessons so that we're looking at the backgrounds of the students, not just the academic backgrounds, but their backgrounds as, uh, you know, as human beings, as, as uh, what, what kind of interest do they have outside of uh, academia, for example. I think it's important to try to look at both the academic and non-academic aspects of one's background and how you try to incorporate a, a lesson plan that really is uh, relevant and meaningful and engaging uh, for the English language learner. If we look at uh, comprehensible input, uh, this idea is basically how to maybe slow up the speech, how to use repetition, how to use hand movements, hand gestures, facial expressions, even realia uh, to 
uh, make the input more comprehensible and, and not forget the fact that uh, the learner is trying to grapple or trying to understand the uh, language and uh, through, through a, in a particular class. Strategies is interesting because I think we can look at it primarily as English language learning strategies, but I think you can also look at pedagogical strategies as well and how those strategies uh, are brought into the, uh, to the classroom. But specifically, we can look at uh, learning strategies by helping students learn how to solve problems, how to predict, how to organize information, maybe summarize, categorize, um, even self-monitor, how they can use their own learning strategies to metacognitively look at their own learning experiences and see and to determine what works and uh, what doesn't work. If we look at interaction, we can uh, look at interactional patterns or group configurations. So students at times will work individually. They may also work in pairs and small groups, and they may work as a whole group. And it's really trying to find that good combination the effective combination of these group configurations in a way that both helps them meet their content goals as well as their linguistic goals. We can also look in terms of interaction at wait time. And I think this is a really interesting concept in that how do we build in wait time that allows students uh, the necessary opportunities to think and communicate. And so I think it's, uh, it's easy to kind of get caught up in the lesson and forget that they are learning an, an additional language and how can we build in the, in the planning of our class time for them to think. And again, this could be within just a, a one class situation where you may give them four or five minutes to think about something before they have to uh, take action or produce or speak or, or write something. Um, it might be even the pacing of how the teacher speaks to the students. So maybe more pauses and, and uh, slowing down the speech, as I mentioned before, kind of relates to pace. But it's actually just how much time do we give them to really think about uh, what it is that we want them to do. Okay. Uh, the next component, practice and application. Uh, this is very important. I, for me, this is uh, where Learners have the opportunities to use manipulatives. So if we look at kinesthetic learning, how can they really, uh, how can we bring hands-on materials or hands-on experiences to the learning um, classroom so that they're actually uh, taking action, being active learners, not passive learners, and really trying to get into the unit by doing something, right? And how can we see how we can apply both the language or combine the language and content objectives together into a cohesive and coherent learning experience? Mm -hmm. And I also look at practice and application, this component of the SIAT model, in terms of how we can integrate all of the four skills. So uh, listening, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, how can we integrate also maybe vocabulary and grammar and pronunciation? We have a lot of different language systems that we need to consider. And of course, we're not able to bring in all of those perhaps at, in every class, but the idea is over time that we're uh, recognizing the importance of spending adequate time in all of those aspects of, of language. Ben, uh, it kind of raises a question for myself. Uh, in your experience, uh, what do you think it's, it's, it, it tends to be a little bit more to focus in, in the application and the practice? Is it that uh, it's kind of uh, language class approach contextualized in whatever content it's, it's giving? Or is it a content class which happens to use the language? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I, I think that's one of the things that I'd like really everyone to kind of reflect on is if we're talking about a general English class, okay, I, the maybe the tendency is to focus more on language and less on content because just by the nature of the, of the course, I, I think we've seen many examples of syllabi where the, the goals are explicitly stated that relate to language, whether it's uh, the notion of the language, the function of the language, 
and and really limiting the objectives to the language part of uh, of those objectives. Okay. And what I'm proposing is or suggesting uh, is to look at maybe even a general course, a general edu English course, mm -hmm. and seeing how content can also be another part of the learning process, another objective that we merge and combine in with the notion of the language, the function of the language, so that we have this kind of a dual aspect, a dual um, a purpose, really, of the class. I think if you were to ask a teacher in, let's say, at the university where we teach, you know, there are many teachers who are teaching content courses in different uh, majors that are teaching in English. In some, in some cases, students okay. are practicing their English, using the English in, in the class. So they're, they're combining to a certain degree a content course. Of course, the objectives of their uh, situation, of their course is, is content. And that would be the flip side of the, uh, uh, if we're gonna compare these two different types of classes, where in their case, maybe they need to focus more and bring in more language objectives to complement the content objectives. So I think it really depends a lot on the type of class, but either way, it's really trying to find ways of using this SIAP model and bringing in both of those two types of, uh, of objectives. And we've talked a lot about this, uh, BD, about the importance of context. And I think yes. this really is about uh, addressing the context of the class. What is the context? What is the, the situation where we want our students to reach out and work towards these, these two very different but very much related uh, sets of objectives? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking at, at, at the model as, uh, as the joker card, <laughs> like filling mm -hmm. a gap which, uh, uh, or helping to fill this gap between the different um, trends in, in, in the use of English in the classroom. We have uh, general English, uh, which happens to also be considered as non-existent <laughs> because there's always a purpose for English by certain authors, right? And then we have the ESP idea, which is uh, teaching English for a very specific purpose. But then we also have the content classes which are taught in English totally. And, and, and what I'm understanding here is that the SAP model can, uh, tends to be in the gap of uh, being able to be adapted to these three different kind of classes, and, and, but bringing pretty much focusing on the context, as you just mentioned. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, having some form in my mind right now, how it works. But, but yeah, I, I look at it like, a, like an adaptable situation of whether how much how much you need of the language so maybe you go towards the grammatical part or the linguistic part in certain moments whereas in another type of courses it may tend to be a little bit more focused on the content let's suppose we're talking about people that learns english for a free service of something or maybe in service people that needs the language or maybe general english classes in which we have a very purposeful um, way of presenting the language. Yeah, I think the easy thing, I think, for many language teachers are, is going to be looking at the site model and say, and say, well, I already do many of these, right? Many of these uh, about, you know, interactional patterns and slowing the pace of speech and so on, you know, especially if they have taken a, a BA uh, in English language training, they may say, well, this is obvious, right? These are things that we, we are trained to do, that we do all the time through whether experience or we learn about it in some sort of course. But I think the, uh, the, the takeaway for me is keeping in mind the whole time when you're talking about all of these aspects of the SIAP model is that you are, again, trying to achieve two objectives. The content okay. objectives or the students need to achieve these two is the content objectives and and the language objectives, and really trying to find ways throughout the model to incorporate both of those uh, into one. 
And for that reason, I, I wanted to just to, as kind of the, the tail end of this discussion is to bring up again, uh, the idea of understanding by design, because I think this kind of complements well the SIAP model, especially in our context, PD, where we have primarily a foreign language learning situation where teachers are teaching uh, learners who don't have a lot of contact with the target language, right? So um, in this case, the backward design, I think, is really appropriate. The, this is a, uh, by Wiggins and McTie, understanding by, des by design. But they basically incorporate this backward design where you first begin by identifying desired results. And I wanted to bring these three uh, to the discussion and how this relates, I think, to the SIAP model. So if we look at how we def define our desired results first, they ask a simple question, what do students need to know and be able to do? So for me, for if we are looking at our own classes, where, whether it's a gen general English course, an academic course, English for specific purposes or whatever, think of what our students need to know. So for me, that's the content aspect of it. That's Those are the understandings part of the uh, equation, if you will. And then the second part is what do we want them to be able to do? Now, this is interesting because this is now more related to skills. One would be knowledge, what they need to know, what they need to be able to do is related to skills. But as you know, we have language skills that we're primarily uh, considering. But in a content course, let's say a math class or physics class, there are also technical skills that are also part of the learning process that that may or may not directly relate to uh, to the li linguistic skills. Mm -hmm. So when I taught, I had the opportunity and pleasure of working with many teachers at the university about helping them uh, incorporate English into their own courses, uh, and to their own subject courses. And we had to actually deal with three different types of results. One was the understandings, that the, that's the content knowledge. But with the skills, we had, had to actually divide those skills into two areas, one being linguistics or being related to language, and the other being a technical skill, because these were, you know, these were teachers who were teaching, you know, again, math and science. And so there was a lot of uh, technical skill involved in doing either some sort of computation or programming, if we're talking about computers and so on, that weren't necessarily uh, the same as, as language, right? So in those cases, they actually had, we had to deal with kind of three sets of desired results, two being two different types of skills. In contrast, for English language learning, I think we could assume that most of the skills that we would try to uh, deal with would be primarily related to language, right? So that we wouldn't be necessarily uh, expecting English teachers to be going into the depths of mathematics and physics necessarily. I mean, you know, it depends on the situation, right? But, you know, I think that it would prim primarily be related to language. So I think it's important to make that distinction here at this level, looking at identifying desired results, look very, looking very closely at what type of class, what type of English class that we're, we're dealing with and understand that it's going to depend on, on the situation. The second yeah. aspect, the determine acceptable evidence. For me, this is the assessment. So notice that the assessment, noting, understanding, and planning on how we're going to assess our students comes before the third step of planning the learning experiences, where for me, planning the learning experiences is where the SIAP model would enter into the equation, right? So the SIAP model is going to be coming in uh, after we've identified the results and we figured out what, how we want to assess our students, both from formative and summative assessment perspectives, and then bringing in the, the idea of some sort of SIAP model mm -hmm. where we try to then incorporate both content and uh, language objectives. Yeah, it, it's giving me the idea uh, of something we also talked before about the purpose and having a, a broader view of the purposes for a class. 
I mean, when we talked about context regularly with with uh, in 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 my classes with the students, when we discuss this, uh, we I, I tend to encourage them to always look for a, a proper context for the linguistic aspect. Now, uh, this view sometimes leads you to a class by class context, and in in some cases it it, it is. Uh, for example, primary schools here in Aguascalientes, they have this model in, in the National Program of Education of having tasks during different classes. So they have objectives in the, uh, maybe four or five classes for one objective. So and pretty much it's also the context in that in that sense. But with this model, I'm, I'm looking at it. I, yes, you have uh, this kind of context and objectives, but you always have to consider the broader view of the whole purpose for the, for the course, which is something we've discussed, something, and taking into account what comes next and what's the relationship with what you are looking at right now and when you have looked at it before and, and connecting the dots and, and making purposeful all of this teaching through not only the language aspect, but the content itself now. Yeah, and how to look kind of through different disciplines, cross-discipline, like if they're learning uh, other... Uh, types of courses that we're bringing in other uh, types of knowledge and understandings that they're learning in other courses and how can we bring that into uh, the court into the the learning experience if we look at like extension courses for example where we might have maybe some students uh, in some cases we might find that knowing what they're majoring in and what their backgrounds are with regard to their studies and how to bring that into the language learning experience I think would be something very much relevant to the site model. You might have then professionals as well that are taking uh, English courses that have some level of experience in the field, in their own respective field, and in those cases doing something similarly where we're as English teachers trying to find their experiences and their knowledge and trying to bring it into the learning experience. I don't think this necessarily means that we need to be experts in these areas, but I think we need to uh, investigate and know enough about uh, both the learners and these different fields in a way and so that we can try to bring in those those concepts into the learning experience and and I can say that you know I again have had uh, the pleasure of working with a lot of teachers at the university who are really experts in their field that know a lot about the, the content and just knowing a little bit about those fields and trying to relate to them basically is what you're trying to do and bring that into and give them ideas about how to uh, you know learn and teach their content in different ways in English I think we can try to do something similarly with our uh, with just a general English course trying to find ways to bring in that that context and it really boils down for me trying to look at some common uh, functions of language that we deal with on a on a day-to-day -day basis in real life like trying to solve problems trying to resolve conflict cognitive conflict uh, trying to form an argument how do we organize our ideas to form or persuade someone to think differently or to take action I mean those are pretty much across the board common uh, you know notions that I think in whatever the field is that we find ourselves that we need to you know be able to communicate in that way right so it's just a matter of kind of aligning those different scenarios uh, of language and trying to fit it into some sort of field of study or some sort of professional context again so that the learners can really relate and they have a purpose of communicating because that's what that's what we do in real life you know we don't we don't set out to discuss every Saturday here thinking okay I'm going to use the, the present tense I'm going to use certain vocabulary no we're it's beyond that we're, we're we have a, a purpose of communicating in this case uh, with each other and online with other educators and the language just becomes a means to an end right so it's really looking at how language becomes a means to an end and the content <clears throat> also becomes <clears throat> excuse me a means to an end to develop the language so it's a reciprocal uh, situation where you've got content <clears throat> trying to help learn learners 
improve language and the language is there to help them learn more about the content. Right. Yeah, I think what I'm taking from here, uh, and I'm gonna really consider this to see how much um, uh, I can work with this, is, is this idea about the class to class context uh, and looking for a context for every class or every couple of classes versus uh, finding a, a, a way of adapting the syllabus to a broader context, which can be like uh, have that it can be there outside at all time while I determine what's going to happen in the classroom, guided not only by the language or by a day by day context, but a broader view of a wider context. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's just to not look at each class as a, an isolated event, but right. one that relates to what they're going to do tomorrow, related to what's going to happen after that, and mm -hmm. seeing where this, the teachers and students have been in the past. So it, it's kind of just a sequence of not just, uh, you know, uh, within the, the day itself of, of activities, but a sequence okay. of daily activities that lead to some broader um, you know, objective. And we've talked about this again with performance tasks, and we can maybe talk about that another day, but <clears throat> looking at performance tasks and looking at that, that ultimate goal that, that learners are, are going to have to achieve over a course of, let's say, a unit, maybe one or two weeks or, or whatever. But but yeah, that's that's really the the idea and what I wanted to kind of bring forth uh, today and share with everyone is this idea of the SIA model, how to bring in two particular sets of objectives, content and language objectives, and, right. and then looking at these greater understandings and, and even essential questions and how we can really uh, bring those two uh, objectives together in both the, the planning and the implementing uh, implementation stages. Right, really, really interesting. I mean, I'm I'm a little bit into ESP in the ESP aspect too, teaching a class on, on its analysis, and it's pretty much uh, it's it's very related uh, uh, with the slight difference that we in in the class I'm teaching we are focusing on on the, um, uh, uh, people that is actually already working with the need of using the language. I mean, uh, English for occupational purposes specifically. But as I mentioned, this this brings a, a kind of a helping to fill the gap that is between how do I jump from a general English class to a content class or ESP or how do I manage this? And I think it's a kind of uh, helping that that way. Yeah, like and, to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Vinny. Yeah, I'd like to invite the, the viewers just to to uh, join us, participate with us, and. Um, uh, visit our different pages we have the page for for the program which is in facebook you can uh, look uh, search for it as teacher learning cast and you're gonna see it uh, if you google teacher learning cast with the name at the end benjamin stewart or pd herrera you're gonna have a lot of results related to the program and the youtube page and uh, our personal websites and uh, we would like to invite you to join us in any way, like asking questions, making comments, or uh, if you want to join us in any talk, we can arrange that and you can join the Hangout, which we are transmitting live. And um, uh, we, we, we would like you to start liking the page and sharing the page with everybody else so we can have uh, a little bit more of a community, more than uh, just two guys speaking. <laughs> yes, and if you have comments, we're definitely interested in your uh feedback and ideas about, in this case, uh, trying to bring in both content and language objectives. Any topics that we discuss, we're, uh, we're always open to uh, revisiting those if you, again, want to bring, be part of the conversation or post uh, questions in Facebook that you want us to address or just want to uh, leave comments. Uh, so feel free to do that. We encourage everyone to do so. And uh, we want, again, to bring in other educators as much as possible into the discussion. So, Pity, I think you wanted to uh, discuss in the next segment about uh, teacher talk time, kind of expand a little bit on what we discussed in prior uh, meetings. So I'll hand it over to you then. Right. I don't know if you can see my screen right now. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. This is one of the regular talks I have uh, with my students at, at uh, uh, specifically in teaching worship. And it's one of the first topics uh, we see in class, which is the use of voice. I wanted to bring it up as a follow up of last week's uh, comment about uh, teachers talking time in the classroom. This talk is a little bit more focused on the idea of the use of voice, the different features of the voice in order to make uh, uh, the, the teacher aware of which are the characteristics that he or she can modify when having a class, when speaking in a class, in order to uh, vary, to have a variety when using the voice. Uh, that's the focus of the talk. But uh, in this case, I'd like to focus on, on, on the first part of it, which is not that much about the features of the voice, but our, it's about general aspects of, of the use. And, and, and this is where it relates to the teacher's talking time that we were discussing last week. If you want to go back to the previous video, Teacher Running Cast Episode 7, we discussed a little bit very generally about the, uh, about the talking time in the classroom. But I, I think the, ma the main thing that I focus on in the class and the first thing that I tell my students and the constant repetition aspect that we have during the whole presentation is uh, this little phrase in which uh, I think it encloses uh, a lot of meaning and I like it a lot. Uh, I, 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 I think I, I composed this from uh, the different sources I have from uh, Garner and uh, sorry, from, from Teaching Practice Handbook and uh, Teach English from Adrian Dolph and, and uh, Teaching Practice Handbook from Gower. And, uh, and some general books from Harmer and in and, and, and teaching. And the idea is that every time that the teacher speaks, it takes away students' opportunity to speak. And um, considering that nowadays we are in, a, in, in, in trend of making meaningful, meaningful classes in which students actually don't just learn things by the sake of learning them, but use them, um, it applies to that situation in which we want students to be the users of the language constantly. It also applies to the weird situation in, in Mexico and I don't know if in other countries, but here in Mexico, it's common. It's a common thing that you uh, know that your students are able to, I mean, language learners uh, are, are capable of um, reading, of, of maybe stating a couple of things in writing. Uh, but speaking is one of the weakest skills when they do not have contact to, with uh, English-speaking countries or they don't travel abroad. And, and it regularly, it's hard to find somebody that has uh, an affluent speaking skill when they don't have contact outside. So this also co uh, helps us to reflect on that aspect and, and having the, the moment to say that uh, it is better that we have our students speaking. Now, last week we were mentioning that it's not just for the sake of diminishing the talking time. And, and also in here, I would say it's not just for the sake of uh, having students speaking. It's, it's for having students practicing and, and, and really using every single opportunity of the class to participate, to activate their minds, obviously to practice the language, to reinforce their pronunciation. And we can go on and on and on by oh, because for the many reasons to have a student speaking instead of the teacher speaking. So this changes a little bit or a lot of <laughs> a lot of bit. <laughs> um, the perspective of the teacher being the one that presents, that gives some information that then is, has the students working in a worksheet or in some in the book or something to complement, right? It gives the idea of having the teacher in constant, permanent interaction with the student, having a balance. Now, uh, the idea is that when you speak in the classroom as a teacher, well, or as a student too, but mainly we're focusing on the teachers right now, uh, uh, the voice says a lot about you. Uh, and if you take over the talking time in the classroom, then it is when, uh, when we see that the main focus of the class is the teacher doing something or the teacher presenting something. 
uh, the teacher being the protagonist of the story in here. All right, and this is not what we want. We want the students to be able to be participating at all times. Now, uh, statistically, uh, we know uh, it's known that the the audience uh, do not capture everything we just said. We need to be careful about the, how we say things, also, and how, which is the way we deliver when we speak in the moments that we speak. Uh, spoken language is fully captured, and then tone and intonation, it's a, a great deal of it, and the most of the thing is the body language. So can we? the question would be, can we substitute a little bit our speaking by movement, gestures, or indications in a different way than just telling students and taking over? That's uh, something a little bit for reflecting at this moment. Um, but I wanted to get, uh, well, this is something that I mentioned last week, the, that the audience only cares about what's the point, what do I do with it and what's the benefit of or what do I get from knowing this? And I think this is a good leading for a classroom too. If you think about the language and the function of the language, it is important to make uh, shortly clear what is the point, uh, how do I do it, and what is the benefit for students to do it? And we are going back to what we just discussed about the context, right? We do have a, a linguistic topic. We do we have a goal for, for linguistic, but what is the function of it? And what is the application in real life so that the students can benefit from learning this? And finally, just not to get to through the whole presentation, while there are different aspects that I mentioned in here and a short activity that I do with the students, and, and how to say things. But the main thing is uh, something that I uh, come to call, uh, to name with the acronym of kissing students. And that's the invitation uh, for today. Kiss students, keep it simple for students when speaking in the classroom. Since every time I speak, it takes away an opportunity for students to speak. The idea is to keep everything I say as simple as possible and in balance, this would be the combination, in balance with the student's participation. So uh, pretty much the focus in here would be like uh, thinking about what am I saying, what are the students doing, and having the idea of going hand-to-hand uh, -hand in the classroom. I do something, students do something. I say something, students respond to uh, with something. Uh, I have the need of uh, having two small aspects to be mentioned together. So I consider that I took a uh, double time in the speaking. So I would need the students to participate at least double as to put it in simple words. It's not a, 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 a there's not a formula for this, but, um, uh, but the idea is to consider the situation that it's not a lecture. It's not a talk. It's not a broadcast like this one. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a situation in which we want students to develop the skill of using the language. And with this idea, uh, I go back to many of the aspects we discussed before. Uh, do you remember when we talked about the opportunities of changing the lesson plan and changing objectives and taking this romantic uh, view of uh, spontaneously students wanting wa uh, willing to learn about something and participate and discuss about something. But all of this with the idea that you are giving them the opportunity to participate, to think, to speak, to, to, to put out whatever, whatever they have inside. And um, my view about this is that besides language, uh, humans being, we have, uh, I, I think in general, we, we mostly have a need of being heard and, and, and being taken into account somehow uh, and uh, and that covers one of the personal needs of maybe not all people, but most of people out there since we live in a society. And giving students the opportunity to speak more and participate more uh, raises this uh, individual non-linguistic need, which also leads me to the to another topic that maybe I mentioned before, which is putting a feeling into the learning. So. Uh, you see, if we go on thinking about the smalls, uh, we can, uh, when we say about let the students speak, the miniature speaking and have them doing it, 
there are many, many, many aspects that we can come up with and ideas and reasons why uh, this can be one of the better approaches to have uh, a lesson, I mean, a language development lesson. I don't know what to think about that, Ben. Yeah, this is interesting. And I, uh, one of the slides that you shared really, yeah. and if I can remember it correctly, the percentages there um, yeah. in the, the categories, you had a slide there that dealt with, I think 7% was related to language, 38% was related to maybe the tone, I think, and 55% was related to body language, if I remember correctly. Yep. And I'm curious for me, though, that really talks a lot about uh, teacher presence, really. I mean, when you're looking at teacher presence, how, how does the teacher uh, present himself or herself in the classroom? And what kind of presence does he or she have? In your experience, I, I'm curious, working with English language educators or teachers in training, which aspect do do they do they struggle with? Which one of those becomes more of a challenge? Is it the language itself? Is it the tone? Is it is it the the body language? And I know they're all kind of related, um, but is there any one of those that uh, that you, based on your experience, kind of uh, it just is is a bigger challenge for them? It, it, it totally depends on the students. They are really different, and that's why the individual work is really important in this type of courses, the individual sessions in which, in which you discuss very uh, uh, personal things for students. Now, uh, uh, as a parenthesis, uh, sometimes there's a trend during the, during the week or, the, or during the classes in which I tend to repeat a lot of same kind of things to students, but as a solution to... Uh, as a standard solution or, or, or ideas to have solutions. But they struggle in different aspects. Here, in, in, in my experience, in, in the BAI work, in uh, language is one of the common things. The, the, the domain of the language, the proficiency of the students is interfering with, uh, with performances. Now, that said, uh, Whatever, whatever their development is, whatever they struggle with, whether it's the language, whether it's uh, the, the tone of voice, whether, whatever, I think more than even the language, the, the main thing that may cause the trouble is uh, whatever they have in their mind from years and years of being in a certain system of teaching, in which their view of a class is, I think I, I already mentioned it uh, somehow before, the teacher presenting something, the teacher being the start in, in the class, giving some information. Uh, now, depending on teacher's interpretation and, uh, interpretation and his or her capacity to, to retain that information and, uh, and select the proper information, right? And that's your idea. I'm the source of information. I have this information and I have to come to the class and I have to come and give that information. And then I have to set the students to do something with it. So I prepare a flashcard, I prepare a voucher, I prepare something so they can work with it. And I think that's the biggest thing because whatever their level or struggle is in technical performance, I think... 90% of the students or more uh, in every class, I need to work during most of the semester on trying to make them aware that uh, a communicative class for students is not the teacher giving information. I present it in this way to them. What's the difference between you and the book? I go to the book and I just read the, the information is there and, I, and the exercises are there. So what do I need a teacher for if you're going to do pre pretty much the same than the book? Now, yes, I know there's a difference between you speaking and, and me reading the book. Yes, but uh, the, the difference is just the delivery. I'm going to read it or I'm going to listen to it. Uh, but, but yes, this is the, the big thing. And that's why last time we talked about talking time and this time I wanted to follow up with 
these features, I mean, the presentation is about the use of the voice, but yeah, it, it goes towards the idea of the talking time and having a student's talking time. Now, this makes the point that I wanted to make uh, with bringing this, uh, this short information. If you have students speaking, it creates in the teacher a lot of needs that needs to be supplied. If you go towards the approach of, I need to make my, my students to speak as much as I'm speaking or more than I'm speaking, it, it creates a lot of needs in you since planning, creation of material, selection of language, uh, I don't know, the register that you're going to use, uh, the talking time, the, the worksheet that you're going to bring, and everything, if you start to adapt many of the class aspects towards the idea of I'm going to have my students speaking more than I'm going to do it, it changes the view. And as a quick example, a presentation class, I have a new grammar feature to present. How am I going to make my students speak if they don't know it, if it's something new? And that's when we go back to the all thought of the teacher presenting the grammar so that they use it later. And I ask my students, how can you do this without you speaking? Don't say it. Now, students cannot tell you because they don't know. So what are you going to do? How do you create this environment? And that raises the need of selecting, preparing, designing, and coming to the class with this idea of let's go hand-to-hand, -hand exploring uh, whatever resources I, I, I kind of prepare and whatever resources you have also, student or you can find to uh, raise learning. Yeah, I, I tend to look at classroom discourse in two general categories. And, and, and what you're, you've been discussing here uh, really made me think about uh, the differences between these two, especially for uh, teachers and training who are also English language learners, because I think that's a very important aspect. And, and I, we, we, I think, talk about it as if it were obvious, but um, for those listening, this is really the situation, I think, where if we look at classroom discourse in two categories, one category being that the, it, the discourse, the discussions come from the teacher to the whole group or from the teacher to a small group or from the teacher to a one individual student, but it's, it's more the presentational aspect that you mentioned. The second category would be the student to the teacher, whether it's an individual student, small groups, or whole group back to the teacher. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, it seems like, if I understand you correctly, it's more like the challenge is when the discourse is coming primarily first from the student back to the teacher, right? Because the planning, if the, if the, the teacher is going to present something, he or she can plan beforehand to kind of get an idea about what what it is they're going to say even though it still might be a challenge if english is in their target language right so there could be a challenge there but i see that uh two things one is how teachers adapt when students are asking questions or just discourse or conversations are coming up they're emerging in the classroom experience and how the teacher adapts how the teacher assesses or turns it into a presentation, but on the moment or in the moment. So based on a, a particular set of circumstances and finding out from the teacher why he or she decided to do that presentation or provide that feedback at that particular moment and so on. For me, that seems, of course, I think more challenging, but it, it's interesting, right, to see how that emerges versus maybe a teacher a trainer who goes in and plans and then presents from the very beginning of the class, for example, something that was planned uh, beforehand. But I, I see kind of a back and forth between the teacher wanting to, to prove, right, because this is a class, right, so the, the, the student is being evaluated, to prove that he or she has a level of English proficiency okay. and also the tendency to want to present Yes. You know, because that they may feel that that's what they're supposed to do when there are other uh, ways, right, of looking and evaluating one's uh, teaching uh, performance. Right. You're bringing a very interesting uh, point in here because I have a personal 
idea. And I don't know how controversial it can be, uh, but I always said that all, per, all people, everybody that wants to be a teacher or thinks about being a teacher, uh, it's a rock star. <laughs> it's a person that wants to be uh, 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 the main character of a group of people, of a situation. And, and now uh, I know I have a lot of students with which different personalities and some of them, they don't look that open or that uh, extroverted as others. But even those students, I, I, my idea is that if you have the, the wheel, if you really are in this career because you want to, I think that's one of the main characters. And, and, and it can... And it, and it is one of the things that contributes a lot to the idea of you being the protagonist of your class and, and taking control of everything in the sense of me speaking, me telling, me showing, uh, and me doing. And, and besides that, because that's a way here in Mexico, we've been taught for many, 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 many years. And hopefully that's changing right now. Okay. But, but in our previous generations, we still had a lot of teachers, protagonists in classroom. And, 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 and yeah, that's an idea that I've always had. We all, all teachers that are teachers because they want to is because they are uh, like a cover, undercover rock stars. <laughs> well, in, in, in your context, like I I'm trying to think from the student standpoint, right? If, if I'm in a class, I'm being observed and there's a question or an issue that comes up, I, my tendency, my desire is going to be like, okay, I know the answer. I need to tell them what the answer is. Right. When another approach could also be taking the time to help the other learners develop the answer themselves. Even though mm -hmm. I know the answer, I'm not going to, and, and that kind of goes against your rock star kind of <laughs> image, right? It's like, if I'm the rock star, I'm going to say, oh, I know the answer. It's this. You need to do this. You need to do this. So that changes the role completely of the teacher where we're trying to actually help students learn that there's other roles where you might say, okay, you know, let's see, let's work this through and see if how I can facilitate the learning process so the students are can can reach the answer themselves. Because as we know, if we can do that, the students are going to uh, retain that information that they're going to learn a lot more if they discover the answers or the language themselves versus we're telling them, oh, you know, what the translation of this is and we're doing all the work, so to speak. Right. Now, let me reinforce a little bit the rockstar thing with the same comment you are making. Now, what about if you don't know the answer as a teacher? What, what does that cost us in teachers? I've seen classes, uh, good classes, like, like in the standards of, performance and technical aspects and content and, and uh, knowing the topic. When a single question from the language learner to the teacher and the teacher not knowing causes a crash and the teacher crashes down because of the anxiety of not knowing the answer. And I think this reinforces the idea of me being the protagonist in the class, me knowing everything and me being able to show you that I know and, and, that, and that's why I'm the teacher, being the rock star, in other words. And, 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 and yes, uh, right now that you mentioned that, when me, when it, when, uh, um, the teacher willing to show that, that he or she knows, it's going to be the same when he or she doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, and it depends on, because we're talking in general, it's going to depend on the yeah. details and how right, much right. The, the student knows or doesn't know. But I think that most of us can relate. I mean, I certainly can relate. There are times that we're in a class and we either we don't know the answer or we say something first and then we're realizing as we say it that, uh, okay, I'm, I made a mistake. And so what do I do in those cases? What do I do when I simply don't know the answer or I just said something and I immediately realize in the moment that I made a mistake, what am I going to do? And I think that you know, my approach has always been, and I've talked to other students about this, other teacher trainers about being honest with your, your students, right? And, and in those cases where you don't know 
you made a mistake or you don't know something just by being honest with your students saying, okay, I'm going to follow up, you know, right. tomorrow we'll discuss it and I'm going to look into that and I'll get back to you. I think that they certainly appreciate that much more than, uh, you know, the BS and, or just some a teacher saying something when the students, because that's the last thing we want to do is, you know, teach them something incorrectly or, you know, knowingly doing that. And um, so I think that, just being honest. Now, if it, there's a level, right? There's there's a degree of knowing and not knowing that needs to be addressed, right? And if you know students need to have some working knowledge of of what's going on, but you know it, the the teacher, if they have the right tools and strategies and and attitudes about the their teaching practice, they're going to learn a lot. As of course, as they gain more experience, so. It's just a matter of being honest with yourself and being honest with your students and and just trying to take every teach every teaching experience as a learning experience and trying to make it work for them and being honest with the students. But um, I think that it's easy to feel kind of intimidated, especially when you're taking a course, a practicum course, and you're being evaluated by by your tutor, you know, that you're trying to put on uh, you know, the best face, so to speak, you're trying to show as much as, you know, how much you know, but I don't think it always has to be in the class itself. I mean, I think your conversations with the tutor reveal, should reveal a lot of information about what the, the student knows, uh, regardless of kind of what happens in, in the class itself, right? So it's that, that tutor relationship, the communication you have outside of the class, the reflections that, that go on there versus uh, or not versus, but in addition to the uh, ex classroom experience. Right. So, so this is it. This is what I wanted to share today. Just uh, I like uh, I would like you to reflect. I mean, everybody to reflect on these ideas. Every time the teacher speaks, it takes away students' opportunity to speak. I think it's this is a kind of rephrase from from a teaching practice handbook from Gower, from Gower. I think is the author, and uh, and the other one. When you have to speak, kiss in the classroom. Keep it simple for your students. And uh, I think the time is, is reaching us, Ben, but I, I wouldn't like to leave uh, without sharing with you uh, something very quickly. I just want to brag a little bit of what happened yesterday. Uh, well, this is a post from an, an event we attended, but I, I wanted uh, to share pretty much the pictures. Uh, Yesterday we had an event in Escuela Normal Federal Superior de, de Aguascalientes, which is a, a school for teachers, for, for public education teachers. And they had an event for, uh, for their beginner students, which they are just uh, starting in this career of teaching and they are just starting to develop the language. And they had an exhibition of different... Uh, uh, different countries in the world, talking about families, economy, and food. And it was it, it looked like a, kind of a, a, a regular test for a class, but uh, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. And the first thing is that uh, uh, m there were a lot of people involved in here. Uh, I like the idea that all students prepare something and where they're ready to have the exhibition and the teacher who, uh, the teacher who organized Tere Fernandez, who organized this event, uh, dedicated some time to invite other universities and coordinators and teachers to the event. So we were there like seven important institutions, seven or eight important institutions of the state uh, were there in the exhibition of students and I could see, besides all of the aspect that this brings together, like making the connection, the link, the, the uh, famous, what we call in here in the autonomy in Spanish, vinculación with other institutions and coordinators and, and, and directors, because we had the subdirectors there and we have the main coordinators of different institutions in there. And uh, more than that, and beyond everything you can say about that, the faces of the students and knowing how important it became for them and how for some of them it was stressful because they know about their language level right now at the beginning 
it, it was kind of a stress, but it became a challenge. And I could see some students when you approach them to 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 the stand, and they would hide behind others, and they would not uh, they would tell you, "Oh, talk to him or not to me" or something like that. But as the time passed by, and they started to see the reaction of us visitors, they started to. Uh, get like uh, in confidence and they started to speak and yes we could see some of the limitations because they are just beginners but they did their best and they tried that and i think it was a great experience beyond the organization and everything that it takes the importance that the coordinator of this event took to include other institutions other people at be, uh, beyond their their world in in their school and making a big deal about something uh, for these students which are just beginning i think this caused an impact that is going to stay with them forever congratulations to the organizers of the event the subdirector of the institution the director of the institution was also, also there and especially to the teacher who organized this event yeah, I think that's really important. And I and pity, and I know we've talked a lot about when we started thinking about this broadcast was to really try to form connections, not just with the university, within, uh, you know, individuals within our own university, but to really try to connect others who have a common interest from other institutions, really, to really make these, these connections, make these opportunities happen. Because, yeah, the the learning experience for for the students to to bring in others outside of other outside the institution where they are uh, studying is so so important and uh, I really think that's that's a, a great uh, experience. I know that we have an event coming up at and our couple of events actually in in, right. in our institution, uh, but one specifically related to teaching aids, uh, teaching aids exhibition that we have every uh, every year that. Our colleague Adriana is uh, is uh, has usually been organizing and planning, and always does a wonderful job with that. So I we look forward to to that next month, and we'll bring more information about that uh, coming forward. But if anyone has uh, certain events coming up that you want to share, uh, this is I think the place to do it. We want to promote any event that relates to to education, English and. It can English language learning or teaching that you want to share. Uh, so feel free to share that information. And uh, we want to try to be the place to for others to connect and, and be more involved in, in the process uh, and hopefully outside their own institution. And I think that's the best way to close today because we have come up to pass the time. And um but yes, join us, please share with us, come with us, and let's make this uh, network, learning network, as we already talked about to the previous shows. And let's share and let's see how, what can we learn from each other. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. I think today we had very interesting topics. Uh, I enjoyed a lot, as always, and hopefully we'll meet you again. Absolutely. Thanks, Petey. And thanks, everyone, for watching and also the recording. And we'll see everyone in the next broadcast. Take care. Yeah, keep on learning. Bye.